Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another of our, our RQT series of programmes. We're looking at supporting the development of teachers um, across the sort of Milton Keynes, Bedfordshire and East and North Hertfordshire uh, and actually further afield as well. So some of you will have already seen uh, some of the work that the Bell Foundation do around supporting students with EAL. Um, we're joined by the wonderful Caroline Bruce from the Bell Foundation to support us with some of our learning and development in that area. So I'm going to not steal too much of Caroline's thunder. I'm going to pass straight over to Caroline. Uh, and she'll be able to pick up from there. <laughs> Thanks, James. Right, let's start sharing. Okay, so um, I'm from the Bell Foundation. My name's Caroline Bruce. Um, I'm the uh, training manager. So the Bell Foundation, um, you, you may have heard of us already. We're a charity which works to overcome disadvantage through language education. And while we do have different strands, our main focus is our EAL programme, which is largely directed at schools and at organisations that work with schools and learners. We've got a national programme of courses, guidance, research and free webinars. Um, and of course, you can find all of that on our website. However, we know that a local offer that takes into account the local context and expertise is by far more impactful. And so we have a number of centres of expertise established in different areas. And we're delighted that um, Chilton Teaching School is one of those. So that's a little bit about um, the, our background. And as part of our work with uh, Chilton, um, the Bell Foundation is running a series of training events aimed at supporting early careers teachers. And the first was aimed at mentors working with early careers teachers. So that's taken place already. And I believe the recording of that is available. And um, this first, the, um, the remainder of the sessions are aimed at uh, the early careers teachers themselves. Um, so, we've got today's which is um, sort of an introduction into EAL so it's the context what EAL means it's diversity it's the factors affecting attainment is the policies uh, very briefly the policies and uh, the pedagogy and so what an inclusive pedagogy looks like the next se session is on the 24th of March and that leads from this section as this session, sorry, and that session's on uh, comprehensible English for learners who are new to English. So it's very much looking at how to make uh, lessons accessible for those learners who perhaps um, are very new to English. And then the uh, third session is um, language for learning, which is uh, the second of our ITT modules, actually. Um, and it draws on um, the sort of accommodating the language demands as well as the learning demands of a curriculum, as well as the content demands of a curriculum. So how to entwine um, language with the curriculum. So, so that gives you an idea of what's coming up. And um, so focusing now on this session. So um, we're aiming to provide opportunities for teachers to develop a broad and well informed understanding of what constitutes EAL. We aim to ensure that teachers are confident about the factors that make um, students who use English as an additional language distinct from each other and how some of those factors might impact on progress and attainment. We're going to very, very briefly look at some of the policies that affect uh, learners using EAL. And we're finally going to look at um, pedagogy surrounding effective teaching uh, of learners who use English as an additional language. And the plan is that um, your current and future pupils will be appropriately engaged and supported to access the curriculum, demonstrate learning and become active participants in the school and in their wider communities. So we're going to look at why focus on EAL, defining EAL, super diversity, EAL and attainment, so the variation factors from research, a little on a policy and a bit more on inclusive pedagogy and what that looks like. So, first of all, if there are 8,342,004 pupils in England, how many pupils 
are classified as using English as an additional language. So if we can put answers in a chat box, that would be great, please. So do we think it's less than half a million? B, less than a million. C, over one and a half million. Or D, over two million. So what do we think it is? I think it was a unanimous decision on D, over 2 million. Over 2 million. Now, I think that that reflects your context. That's my feeling. So the answer is C. So let's look a bit more closely at that then. So um, we can see that there's a very slight dip since uh, in 2020. Um, but it is, it's still a huge number, isn't it? So it's almost one in five of all of our pupils um, use English as an additional language. And then we've got this a bit more breakdown here. Um, and we can see, so this is the national picture here. So we can see that the much higher numbers in state funded nurseries, so where almost 29, almost 30% uh, in nurseries speak English as an additional language. We know from the census data that this is largely children born in England to uh, to migrants, so it's not it's not predominantly new arrivals. So th these numbers will obviously feed through, um, or they're expected to feed through into primary schools and then into secondary schools. So uh, you know, we this is a this is a, a picture that's here to stay. So that's why we need to be considering this group of learners, and we can look a little bit more closely at your um, specific area. So I'll just give you a moment to look at the that data there, and perhaps perhaps you're not surprised at all perhaps there's some surprises in there so it's all just taken from the school census so it's all easily accessible um again you might want to look at the the high numbers in nursery um particularly uh, bedford 41.9 percent um in nursery um using english as an additional language um so yeah this is this is certainly a, a picture that's here to stay for some time. So let's look a bit more then. We know why we need to look at EAL. The numbers are huge the, um, of learners who are using English as an additional language. They've uh, doubled, more than doubled since uh, 1997. Um, and we know that this is a very normal and valuable part of uh, the classroom. We know also from um, data that 41% of teachers, even in, it was the data is actually from 2019 because there isn't more recent data, but we know that 41% of teachers teach children from diverse backgrounds. So we know that this is absolutely the norm and that teachers will be working with um, very, very diverse classrooms where there's a variety of languages spoken. So, and another reason why we know that it's important to focus on EAL is in the teacher standards, we know that um, teachers are expected to have a clear understanding of the needs of all pupils, including those with English as an additional language. And we know that teachers are expected to learn how to be able to use and evaluate distinctive teaching approaches to engage and support those learners. And although there's no mention of English as an additional language in the ECF, it's still quite clear that there's an expectation that teachers will take into account the fact that pupils will learn at different rates and require different levels of support in order to succeed. Um, and, you know, it's very clear that we do want high standards for absolutely everybody um, so that everyone can achieve their potential. Um, and it, and you know, we'd very much emphasize that the the ECF, although you know, perhaps 
perhaps adaptive teaching is the obvious point to look at in terms of meeting the needs of learners who use English as an additional language, we would very much advocate looking at the whole way through the framework and seeing how we can infuse EAL the whole way through it. It's not, it shouldn't just be a bolt on in that um, in adaptive teaching. Um, so almost having that group of learners at the back of your mind, um, regardless of what section you're looking at. We know also that the uh, national curriculum expects um, teachers to plan teaching opportunities to help people develop their English um, and should aim to provide the support people's need to take part in all subjects. And it's interesting there, isn't it, that there's the distinction between develop their English and taking part in all subjects. So uh, we know this the importance of this and now an, an extra reason of course of why EAL needs focusing on is uh, the impact of the pandemic and the Bell Foundation added um, a set of questions to the NFER ser teacher survey um, last year looking at the impact of the pen pandemic and th so this is sort of um, pulling together teachers perceptions and Rachel Scott um, from the Bell Foundation wrote a report based on uh, the findings. Um, and um, two thirds, of, as it says, I mean, there's more detail on the Bell Foundation website on, in the report itself, but two, th two thirds of teachers reported a negative impact on the English language skills of pupils using English as an additional language after schools were closed. Um, and this this is obviously the missing out on the learning opportunities like everybody else did um including for example um you know maybe limited access to technology and maybe you know there was various reports on um the importance of support from parents where parents haven't got the the same level of english needed to be able to support it's very difficult for those parents to be able to provide that support so that was definitely an impact and there was also the impact of on the opportunity to learn English, the actual language of English, so they weren't necessarily students weren't having the same models, um, opportunities to hear, to speak, to read and write, and not just in terms of the academic language development, but also we know the importance of social language development, which I'll speak a little bit about later. Um, and I, you probably heard on the radio this morning as well, actually, about the the high numbers of children. Um, missing time in education and um, with the Children's Commission has spoke on uh, the news this morning about this and and we know that this is very likely to include children who are using English as an additional language. So and then we do have the information from the DfE um, so I'll put the primary and secondary here. Um, so although this doesn't look as disheartening, this this final piece of data doesn't look as disheartening, um, it could be very misleading in that it clusters all of the EAL learners into one group. And um, we're going to go on next to look at why that, that will be a problem um, and generally why the term EAL is actually an issue. So, going to we need to know exactly what we mean when we're talking about EAL. And the official definition you can see here, um, taken from the DfE, a pupil is recorded to have English as an additional language if they are exposed to a language at home that is known or believed to be other than English. This measure is not a measure of English language proficiency or a good proxy for recent immigration. And it's interesting because this second sentence was actually added into the definition. And so I suppose it's it's the DfE recognising that the, the, the definition itself is flawed um, and was presenting problems. So researchers have um, looked at this and, uh, you know, identified these as being this as being problematic. So it it clumps together, like I said before, this huge, diverse, heterogeneous group of all of the pupils in a single group. Uh, EAL only tells us a very binary piece of information, either um, 
either yes or no. It gives no nuanced information. And actually, it's not a terribly useful label. Um, and then it's based on, I'm sure you noticed that in the definition, it's exposure. So it's only based on the, the concept of a learner being exposed to another language at home rather than language proficiency. So as well as having the label EAL, it doesn't tell us anything. So it, it, as in that EAL label doesn't tell us anything about the proficiency in English. Neither does it tell us anything about the proficiency in their home language. They could simply be exposed to another language. They may not be proficient in it. And that's going to take us on to super diversity. Um, and super diversity. So we, we, we saw in that definition then that um, that it's flawed that learners who um, are labelled as EAL actually includes this huge group, this heterogeneous group, and they've arrived perhaps at different times. So we will have families who are well established, second, third generation families. Um, but also in, under the same term EAL, we've got newly arrived families, um, perhaps families who've arrived as refugees. And ev yes, even in that new arrivals group, we've got this, this huge, huge variety. We've got families who've arrived as refugees under very diff difficult circumstances um, who may have very limited or broken experiences of education. Or we might also have um families who are very privileged very um fortunate experiences of education very privileged experiences of education and of life so far you might have um the the family of a french banker for example sitting alongside the family of um a somali refugee um, but they're still all clumped underneath the label eal and so in that group, we know that um, the learners have different strengths and very different needs. And so it's, it's, it's something really worth considering that just because a, a child has that label EAL, it tells us very little information. Um, which dimensions of diversity might need to be taken into account when working specifically with learners with EAL? So just wondering if you have your own thoughts on what dimensions of diversity, if we, if we consider that it's a huge diverse group, what elements of diversity might need to be taken into account when working specifically with learners who are using English as an additional language? Social background, definitely. Um, and they're, they're, that will tie in then to their reason for um, arriving in the country. Definitely the age, um, and we're going to talk about both of those in a second actually. Religious beliefs, mm, it, po quite possibly. It certainly needs to be taken into consideration in terms of um, their, their experience of education as a whole. Um, the family cycle in terms of parents were never taught. Absolutely. Um, families' experience of education, um, their perceptions of education um, is really important um, in terms of how how a family will engage with the school, for example. Karen, there was one question I just wanted to solve because out of my oh, yeah. own curiosity as well, could gender be a factor? Um, it's in the chat. I just didn't know if there was anything whether you're, from your experience. Oh. I, I haven't seen anything in the research, um, so, but I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Um, they'll because there's there's a there's differences in terms of different cultures and um, gender and their experience of education. So, for example, we know that um, some countries, um, you know, the girls are denied as much educate as much opportunity to education. So, gender will definitely be um, a factor in that sense. Um, whether there's been any research in terms of um, progress and attainment in England um, I'm not confident about it's certainly not one of the main factors um, so I don't know whether so the the gender issue beyond um, beyond EAL certainly an issue but combined with EAL that might be a different picture so um, I'll, I'll, I'll we'll go through some of the main factors though. Perfect. Thanks Caroline. Okay.
So we're going to look more specifically at research now then into the variation factors which um, affect uh, attainment using English as an additional language. We're going to go into breakout rooms and um, you'll have a little bit of time to read that um, extract and to also answer the questions, to think about the questions. And what we really want to do is think about, in particular, think about the opportunities and the challenges surrounding his experience of education in his new school. So what are the opportunities that this child faces, has, and what are the challenges that he faces? Um, so opportunities going for our son, he's confident and he has good social skills, he's inquisitive, there's a great team supporting him, he learns how to use Braille, he's, he has supportive and ambitious parents and the school makes really good use of buddies and peers as we've mentioned. Our son had very limited schooling before the age of 11 because of his own personal circumstances. He's not literate in Arabic, as we've already mentioned, and his visual impairment is significant and degenerative. He, he's experiencing trauma related to the refugee experience um, and school is likely to be our son's probably only source of English language initially at least. So, so really, really significant um, factors that, that will affect his attainment and they're all, they're all part of that picture, aren't they? So we'll look a little bit at the research around this now then. So um, the Education Policy Institute and the Bell Foundation and Unbound Philanthropy uh, published a report um, looking into funding and the policies around the provision for learners using EAL. And Joe Hutchinson, uh, who's the Director of uh, Social Mobility and Vulnerable Learners, um, identified four factors which um, were, identif were, were identified as the, ver the key variation factors in terms of attainment. Um, and I'm not going to go into huge amounts of data here because um, our, our focus here is on um, responding to these findings. Um, but if you're interested, there's lots more information in the reports themselves on, on our website. Um, so, but Joe Hutchinson's main, uh, the four main factors are, as we've already discussed, prior educational and life experiences, the level of um, proficiency in English, age of arrival in the English school system, and the first language spoken. So we're not going to go into vast amounts of detail, but I'm going to give you a little bit of information in, in background information. So the main factor is the level of English proficiency. And of course, that makes sense. So and um, backing up this report by Joe Hutchinson, um, Professor Steve Strand and Anina Hessel's report, which was um, commissioned and published by the Bell Foundation in 2018, analysed local authority data and they reached the same conclusions as Hutchinson, that low proficiency in English is the single most important factor um, in, in terms of a student not reaching their potential in the examination system. Um, and proficiency in English accounts for a huge 22% of the variance in attainment for a child who speaks English as an additional language in comparison to 3 to 4% of the variance associated with either ethnicity, gender or free school meals. Um, so ensuring then that um, learners who speak English as an additional language um, are supported in the school system to learn English through the curriculum should be an absolute top priority. Um, so making sure that that proficiency um, increases and we'll just take a quick look at that. So in 2016, the ideal set of data became available. So the, the um, DFE um, made it compulsory to report um, a, a learner's proficiency level. And they um, 
they they identified five bands so you can see those on the screen there in front of you ranging from a new to english through to e fluent and this data was so schools reported on the the learners um proficiency in english and this data was then became the idea this ideal set to be analyzed to look at um the, the factors affecting attainment in terms of proficiency in english and the um, Strand and Hessel's main findings were that those learners who were um, at bands A and B um, were, were significantly far from the national average across all phases, all examination points. The learners who were new to English and at early acquisition um, were, were not close to the national average. Once a learner reached developing competence in terms of their proficiency in English, they were close to the national average. And then interestingly, once a learner had reached competent or fluent, they actually exceeded the national average. So you can see then that there's a real need to um, support learners to reach developing competence at least um, so that they're able to achieve their potential. Now, the same set of data, this um, this set of data from 2016, this, so the DfE um, ended, the, they, only, they only kept this requirement to report uh, proficiency in data for one year, unfortunately, which means that there's never been this perfect set of data since then. But using that one set of data, the DfE produced an ad hoc report, and it's absolutely packed with um, details details and graphs and data in terms of variations in um, attainment for learners using English as an additional language. Um, but th this is sort of like a, a useful summary in terms of attainment. And you can see, uh, particularly for um, GCSE English, so students um, in key stage four, the discrepancy between the learners who are new to English and then those who are fluent. So particularly at those uh, later key stages, is the the need to re reach competent and fluent is really huge there as you'd expect so the second factor that joe hutchinson identified was the age of arrival in the english school system and this kind of ties in with uh, somebody mentioned age before and it kind of ties in with that because it's the length of time that uh, a child has had to learn english um, and to learn um, to learn through English as well. Um, so Hutchinson explored the impact of the length of time in the English education system on GCSE grades. And you can see here then that um, at GCSE, pupils identified as using English as an additional language scored an average of a C if they'd arrived in the school between reception and year seven. If they'd arrived between uh, years eight, nine and 10, um, th their average score decreased to a D and then inevitably of course it decreased even further to an E um, it, if they uh, arrived in year 11. Now that does not take into account proficiency in English um, so I, I, obviously if it took into account proficiency in English um, the, the uh, average the, the GCSE grades would be even lower for those learners who are um, at the earlier bands. So clearly then the later the arrival time, the less time to learn the English language needed for the exam content and the specific demands of the English curricula, subject curriculums. Um, and there's a severe attainment penalty for those students who are arriving closest to the exam date. Um, so we know then that there's a real urgency for supporting those learners arriving at the latest points in their education. And the, um, the, the next factor, the third factor affecting attainment, um, Joe Hutchinson looked at the languages, a variation in, um, in terms of their language spoken and their, their results at key stage two. And she identified six languages which, which consistently achieve significantly below the national expected standard. So Pashto, Punjabi, Turkish, Portuguese, Czech and Slovak. Um, 
whereas consistently um, even as late as um, key stage um, sorry year five arrival languages um, such as Tamil Chinese and Hindi were still scoring um, above the national expected standard at key stage two so very very briefly we will look at um, policy um, so there is a mainstreaming policy and this has been the case for many years in England um, and the idea is that um, learners are placed in mainstream classes um, soon after they settle in school um, and that inevitably um, presents opportunities as well as challenges. Um, so it means then that students shouldn't be left on their own, they should be integrated within the classroom, they shouldn't be removed and taught uh, on a one to one, except there are obviously cases, you know, particularly for new arrivals, it might be for, you know, a very time specific um, focused intervention. Um, that's that's a different case. I'll mention that briefly in a second. Extra support then should be provided based on individual needs rather than a, a sort of a blanket, um, or, you know, where it covers absolutely everybody and everybody gets exactly the same coverage. It should be based on absolute individual needs of the learner. Um, but this obviously then presents this challenge. It makes the, the subject teacher responsible for supporting the language development of pupils using English as an additional language. And I'm not going to talk about um, funding in any detail here, but we know that the, the lack of ring fenced funding means that there's um, there's less and less money going towards those learners. There's not necessarily the, the expertise within the school or, or even locally to support those uh, learners. And um, within the school itself, it might be that there isn't, you know, the, the teaching assistants, for example, who are able to regularly provide as much support as we might like and so it really puts a lot of focus on the the teachers as being responsible um, for the language development of the pupils who are using English as an additional language um, and the reason why we, we would always advocate mainstreaming um, is uh, the very very clear reasons um, they we don't want learners to lose those valuable opportunities for um, learning the subject matter uh, so learning those subject matter the subject content so the the classroom teacher is the best person to teach that subject content we also know that um, learners benefit from a huge range of different language models whether it's the different teachers it's the different students in the classroom and so um, in terms of linguistic inclusion as well as an academic inclusion we know that the classroom is the best place for um, those learners and finally in terms of um, social inclusion we know that um, learners using English as an additional language need those really rich valuable opportunities to bond with their peers um, and if you're interested there's a report by Manzoni and Rolf um, published in 2019 um, which goes into a lot more detail on this it's really it's really interesting but it does mean though um, that the, the, the teachers are responsible for the learning. Um, so, and that brings us then to look at, if we know that we've got higher numbers of learners who are using English as an additional language, we know the factors that are affecting their attainment, but we know that there's um, limited resources perhaps in a school to support those learners. We know then that an inclusive pedagogy is really, really important in our classrooms. Um, so, um, in, in a, a really fabulous book um, by Michael Evans, um, he advocated this inclusive pedagogy as looking at like four, um, four quadrants and we've rearranged it slightly and we've put teachers inclusive um, attitudes at the bottom and th the idea here is that all, with, with all four of these quadrants 
um, we, we can achieve an inclusive, a truly inclusive pedagogy. And the reason that we've rearranged it is um, we've, we've put teachers at the bottom because they're underpinning all the others without the teachers inclusive attitudes um, the the rest um, can only be of limited success. So um, we're going to think a little bit now about teachers' inclusive attitudes. There's a real fear around the term EAL and we need to reframe that narrative and um, not consider those learners or not automatically feel that those learners present a burden or present more challenge than opportunity, for example. Um, and so probably those those teachers and educators who've had little experience working with learners who use English as an additional language or little training, perhaps they might feel that they present more of a burden. And, and, and we understand that because they do present challenges in terms of, for example, communication with parents or how to include them in school life, how to meet their academic needs. Um, and, and as we've seen from all that data in terms of meeting those, all those assessment targets, so particularly where a class is approaching national tests and you know if a new arrival joins your class and they're new to English, it is a real, real challenge. Um, but we do want to find ways to challenge that sort of um, assumption that it's a burden and sort of realign th this feeling that an EAL learner is actually an asset to the classroom, not just to, um, you know, to the class, to the whole school, in fact, um, because we know that multicultural and multilingual classrooms provide a wealth of knowledge and experience, whether that's um, geographical or historical or political or religious um, and that contributes to this diverse and truly inclusive education for all of the students. Um, so we're going to look a little bit now at um, in teachers inclusive attitudes um, and we're looking in particular at the ease of implementing specific teachers inclusive practices. Um, so which practices might be the easiest to um, implement? Fabulous. Um, so what do you think might be the easiest to implement in terms of teachers' at inclusive attitudes in a classroom? So absolutely seeing beyond the EAL, getting to know that person, what are they interested in? Um, you know, having those conversations, finding those opportunities to, to chat is so, so useful. Um, and knowing beyond the label of EAL to know a bit more context as well is really important. So um, you can see then that all of these were, were ideas about, um, you know, having that those um, good practice um, opportunities, but also thinking that some of, it's so important to find ones that are quick wins so that we are including our learners um, who are new to English without making huge amounts of work for the teachers. Um, and we know that there's, um, you know, the, out of the, the best will in the world where um, the, the, we've seen lots of classrooms where out of fear maybe, out of worry that the learner will feel out of their depth and too challenged with whatever work the class is doing. They're given work that's entirely different to the rest of the class. And, and we know that the teachers then need that guidance, that reassurance, that support, and that it needs to be good practice throughout the whole school, that inclusive pedagogies are um, 
you know, are, are truly inclusive, that they are properly resourced, that teachers are um, have that expertise, have that training. Otherwise, there's there's real danger that the inclusive that the the the, the attempts by the teacher actually end up being unsuccessful. Um, and so we'll just look at very quickly, we should um, aim to um, have this linguistic inclusion. Um, so making languages, making good use of um, all of the different languages that are available to a learner. Um, and and we know that this is uh, <laughs> this is it's the dream, isn't it, to use all of those languages. Um, but we know that particularly as you go through the key stages and you get close to the assessment points, children are assessed in English. But finding those ways to include languages and make use of languages is really important. And it might be, for example, as simple as um, using the the uh, linguistic repertoire that a child has. It might be so, for example, in this example, um, the the child goes between languages, um, and we've seen other. You know, we know that this this happens a lot. That children use certain words from one language, certain words from another language, to suit the situation. And if they're encouraged to do that. Um, it will be really uh, beneficial to uh, their, their subject learning and their language learning. Um, and other opportunities for using um, their, their, their full repertoire of languages. Remember, lots of children speak more than two languages. Um, so we've spoken a little bit already about first language buddies. Um, being allowed to think or plan in their first language um, or have those first discussions in their first language, initial concept discussions. Um, as a teacher myself, I always found it useful to um, sort of preempt a lesson, give give um, the topic to the children um, and get them to find out some information in, in about that lesson in their first language so that they come in armed with some of the ideas and then it becomes less onerous in the lesson itself um, they're thinking more about the language in the lesson rather than just uh, rather than both the subject content and the language so annotating and keeping notes in the first language we've spoken already we need to find out whether uh, the child is fully literate in their first language if if they're not then they won't be able to annotate and keep notes researching a doc a topic uh, keeping bilingual glossaries um, using technology to support um, in that sense as well um, so it might be enabling um, captions it might be um, using the, um, the the spoken versions enabling subtitles and so on we'll look then at academic inclusion um, and we know that schooling education is fundamentally all about language. The, the content, the subject content is presented through language. Students are uh, assessed using language um, and the, the language demands in subjects are increasingly complex. Um, so we know that there's a huge um, pressure in terms of the language development for children. Um, and we've looked already at the importance of teachers having high expectations of learners. Um, and we know that this is really difficult where learners are uh, new to English and you know, finding ways to um, help support that learner access uh, content is, is really, really difficult. Um, but in the early, those early stages, subject learning can be jeopardised if participation in classroom activities um, is, is constrained. So central to an inclusive pedagogy is identifying um, strategies that will allow learners to engage in the curriculum and allow them to make academic progress. Um, now, the 
these are quite broad considerations here and there obviously there's obviously much more nuance that we could go into but in term we just very generally these are the key pointers so combining mainstream with additional support we've already touched on very briefly we know from the teacher standards the importance of lessons which inspire motivate and challenge all of the pupils um, and the same is true for learners using English as an additional language. We want to keep the cognitive challenge appropriately high. Um, we don't want to dumb down the content. Um, for example, if you have a new arrival who's got a secure knowledge of maths, um, you know, fitting with her year group, she shouldn't be put into a, a lower math set just because um, her the language, her English language around maths isn't um, matching her, her understanding of maths. Instead, um, the appropriate support needs to go into the lesson and into supporting her maybe before the lesson or with a buddy or pre-teaching vocabulary or providing work to go home um, but she shouldn't be penalized and you know it should the, the less she shouldn't be put into lessons that are too easy for her um, we know that tied in with that then that students arrive with a, a, a solid knowledge and understanding of subject knowledge and that just needs to be translated into their own language it needs to be translated into English it becomes more of a, a language learning activity so it's important to tap into this knowledge that children have already got irrespective of the language that they speak to help them make those connections that enable further learning to happen and that takes us back to setting those high standards and um, in, you know ensuring that learners do keep aiming high. Um, so the next point then is bilingual support and some schools are lucky enough to have members of staff um, who speak the same languages as their learners and, and this is obviously an incredible resource um, and, and you know it, it's really wonderful academically and psychologically and socially if a, a child um, you know is able to work with a member of staff who who speaks the same language. Um, and but another way of uh, providing bilingual support might be using bilingual materials where they're appropriate, um, particularly useful to provide before a, a content-based lesson. Um, so as I said, I, I used to send materials home um, so that they could be discussed with family um, before before my lesson. Um, and, but we, we, we know, though, that we don't want, you know, people, we don't want teachers having to sort of recreate lots and lots and lots of um, materials. So we'd really urge people to to share what they have, to find good sources. There's some great websites. Um, EAL Highland is a really useful website, a local authority website that has glossaries and translated materials on there. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd really, really urge you not to um, reinvent the wheel and um, take on too much work. And the next one is simplifying the learning process. And the next session, actually, the comprehensible English session is linked to this. So this is the idea of um, rather than it simplifying the content, we're simplifying the process of learning. Um, so we don't we don't want to. Um, dumb down the, the content we want to simplify the process and it might be as simple as um, teachers grading their own language or adapting the instructions or breaking down the tasks or providing visuals and there's a section on our an area on our website called great ideas which has um 20 um, strategies together with videos and resources of strategies that we know are successful um, of, for working with learners who uh, use English as an additional language. And then the final um, section is probably obvious. So promoting assessment for learning and, and involving the learners in that. And by assessment for learning, we don't just mean for the subject, but we mean for their language development as well. Um, and it might be that your schools are already using an assessment tool for their English language proficiency. So the Bell Foundation does have um, 
a, a framework, an assessment framework that was um, developed from those five bands that we looked at earlier. Um, and you can find out about that on our website. It's free to download, it's free to use. Um, but obviously look at what your scores are using first um, and because if we're able to support learners with um, classroom strategies and providing targets that are appropriate for those um, th those bands then we know that we can support learners to move through those proficiency bands and then be more likely to uh, reach their potential in terms of their academic achievement as we saw with all that data previously. So and then finally, we've got social inclusion. We've already mentioned the importance of having uh, first language buddies and language ambassadors. So um, Hampshire um, MTAS team has got um, a really fabulous scheme called uh, the Young Interpreters Scheme. Um, but it's equally it's equally as possible to set up your own language ambassadors um, and this can you know really raise the the profile um, of learners who speak English as an additional language really raise the profile of multilingualism um, so um, having um, maybe representatives who, from different language groups who can represent the school for example at open evenings or events or parents evenings and that's not to say that they're involved in confidential discussions but you know doing that sort of like meeting and greeting and taking people to the right places and so offering that support um, as well as the initial survival support that a, a, a more of a buddy type role um, for new children who are new arrivals um, and it is really wonderful really really wonderful seeing that the, the pride and the sense of achievement when um, children do take on those um, ambassador roles um, and you know see that that their language is such a huge part of them and it's being valued by their peers and by their school um, and, and social, we know that as well, we really want to stress that social integration isn't just the classroom and integrating in activities in the classroom, it's even beyond the school. Um, and factors that affect this um, will vary from context to context. So for example, you might have um, isolated learners or children with much more nuanced backgrounds. So, um, and we know that language that develops socially um, then often develop the, you know the language that might develop on the playground it, it comes before academic language but actually it's needed not just for those social interactions but also to provide that bridge to academic language so if you think of all the sort of the tier one vocabulary that comes first um so you might think of a word like bend if a child understands bend and can can use the word bend then they're much more likely to be able to understand and then move on to words like refract when it comes to the language of science for example um, so in a, a report um, commissioned by the Bell Foundation carried out by um, University of Cambridge and Anglia Ruskin University, um, they looked at school approaches to the education of um, students using English as an additional language, but not just at the language development and academic achievement, they looked at the social integration of those learners as well. And the factors affecting social integration vary from school to school and from time to time. So if we think today, listening to the news at the moment, we know then there will be schools, um, you know, children who themselves are Russian or whose families are Russian may have been perfectly well integrated in school into school life a month ago but more recently have seen that shift in how they're perceived by their peers and schools will need to be responding to that really sensitively but it's just that idea that you know that social inclusion can vary it, you know different factors can impact on it so um, it does need to be school level not just in a classroom it's not just classroom based um, but more generally most schools would 
report that they've got very successful um, procedures in place to ensure that new arrivals are well integrated into school life for the first few weeks and months. But the important thing then is continuing that beyond the welcome period. Um, and, and again, that sits with a school level decisions and taking us back to um, the attitudes of the teacher, but also the whole school ethos. Um, think of actions that you will put into place now um, in your in terms of your own experience of teaching, your own experience in the classroom. Um, so there's what will you look for? What might you ask about? What we read about and what might you try to do? That's brilliant, Karen. I'm going to give people time to sort of respond and answer to those statements. But yep. I'm just going to remind those that are here as well. Um, and equally for the purposes of uh, uh, kind of this, obviously, the session gets recorded and will be distributed via YouTube as well. So people can kind of come back to the session, join back in. And I think obviously kind of really as well push and promote some of the, the content, obviously, that we were talking about, so the great ideas section on the Bell Foundation website. And I think, you know, having looked at it again myself today and just even those sort of snippets of bits and pieces that people can take away to sort of put in and take into their classrooms as well. So, um, you know, do engage with that. Have a look at the Bell Foundation website. There's a wealth of stuff on there, both in terms of um, content that is you can work with Chilton to look at how we can support your school within that, but equally just ideas that you can take immediately straight away into your classrooms. I think as well, um, so I was also going to say about as well as the great ideas, um, we've got um, courses coming up as well. Um, so if, if you look on the website, there's um, we've got a new arrivals course uh, starting. We've got um, introduction to assessment. We've got teaching assistant course. We've got a variety of courses coming up. And we've also got webinars, free webinars coming up next week, actually, on um, developing vocabulary for learners who are uh, new to English. Um, so um, so there's the other sessions and I'll also just quickly show you this. Um, so there's the courses that we've got coming up um, quite imminently. Um, so introduction to EAL assessment, teaching assess assistance course and embedding assessment course. And they're all um, three hour online courses. And we've also got the uh, vocabulary webinars, as I was as I mentioned before. Um, a massive thank you, Caroline. Really, really informative session. I uh, posted a couple of bits out on Twitter and uh, just a sort of really interested and a really well informed session. That obviously, I, you know, really pleased that we've been able to have you uh, share that with us today. So, thank you for your Absolute time today. Pleasure.